About a month or so ago, now GitHub took down YouTube DLB in a DMCA takedown notice that claimed anti-circumvention. So it was basically saying that YouTube DL was a tool to break YouTube DRM system to download copyrighted material. And this was filed by the RIAA, the Recording Industry Association of America, who is absolutely notorious for going after DMCA takedown notices. And right now they're actually in a battle with Twitch doing the exact same thing they did to YouTube about 10 years ago. So luckily in the case of YouTube DL though, it's now back up on GitHub. So GitHub released this blog post here called Standing Up for Developers, YouTube DL is back. And we're gonna be reading through this today to see what GitHub has actually done. So today we reinstated YouTube DL, a popular project on GitHub after we received additional information about the project that enabled us to reverse a Digital Millennium Copyright Act takedown. So this additional information was in the form of a dispute filed by the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Now. I'm not going to be reading through this today, but basically they explain why YouTube DL is effectively doing the exact same thing that a web browser is doing. And if we're going to say that YouTube DL is a DRM circumvention tool, then a web browser is as well, which is pretty much the claim that I made in my original video. And not even the RIAA would be dumb enough to try to make that claim because that would pretty much eliminate the way the internet currently works. They also talk about the comments that reference commercial music inside of the unit tests. And pretty much what they say here is that just because there are comments saying it can be used in this way doesn't mean that it has to be used in this way. But let's get back to the original blog post. They say, we share developers' frustrations with this takedown, especially since this project has many legitimate purposes. Now, one of those being the archival of Creative Commons Media. So if you went on Twitter after YouTube DL was taken down, you'd notice there was a lot of archivists who were saying, I basically can't do my job now because this tool is absolutely fundamental to what I'm doing. So our actions were driven by processes required to comply with laws like the DMC that put platforms like GitHub and developers in a difficult spot. So this is talking about Safe Harbor. Now I mentioned this in my previous video, but Safe Harbor is basically where a platform has to make a reasonable attempt to try to remove infringing content from their platform. And if they don't do so, then they're going to be liable for damages. Now in the case of YouTube, the reason why they can keep videos up is because when a video has been claimed, they just send the ad revenue to the owner of the material. But in the case of GitHub, there's not really any way to do something that can actually keep the repo up. And they reinstated the repo because after they found this additional information mentioned up here, they realized that it wasn't actually circumventing a technical protection measure, otherwise known as a TPM. Now, I've never actually heard anyone use the term TPM, but I'm guessing it's an actual technical term being used. And this was in line with our values of putting developers first. We know developers want to understand what happened here and we want to know how GitHub will stand up for developers and refine our processes on these issues. So the rest of this article is basically answering these sorts of questions. So the first one that we have is why did GitHub actually process this takedown in the first place? So GitHub being a US based company must comply with US law. And in some cases, this will actually force them to remove code. If that code has a multitude of non-infringing uses, if it is in fact found to be designed to circumvent a TPM, but this is exceedingly rare. Now, you actually can go see a list of all of the MCA takedown notices that are actually available on GitHub because it's under a public repo. And this is part of GitHub trying to be some level of transparency. So let's go to 2020 and let's go to, I think October had a few interesting ones. So under October, as you can see, most of them are going to be just, hey, look, someone either stole my code or someone stole my project and they try to claim that it's their own. Or in this case, there are counter notices that are public as well. So the only one I found in here where it's actually trying to circumvent a technical protection measure is in the case of the JetBrains one here, which is about cracking the JetBrains software. Over on the blog post, they say that less than 2% of DMCA takedown notice would be processed are based on circumvention claims. And of those 2%, this was a particularly unusual case. So DMCA takedown claims based on circumvention are a growing industry-wide issue for developers with far-reaching implications. Now, I imagine this is due to the fact the RIAA is seriously starting to crack down on platforms. So as I mentioned before, they're going after Twitch now. As we've seen, they're going after GitHub and they're probably going after other platforms as well, as well as other organizations following suit. 
Next up, we have a bit of background information about how circumvention claims actually work. So most DMCA takedown notices they receive are from someone saying, I actually own this thing. The person who has this repo, they don't have the rights to it. Please take it down. So in the case of YouTube DL though, it wasn't like that at all, which confused a lot of people because a lot of people just simply didn't know about this sort of DMCA takedowns. So this fell into a category called anti-circumvention, an allegation that the code was designed to circumvent technical measures that control access or copying of copyrighted material in violation of section 1201 of the DMCA. Now, section 1201 dates back to the late 1990s and did not anticipate the various implications that it has for software use today. As a result, section 1201 makes it illegal to use or distribute technology, including source code that bypasses technical measures that control access or copying of copyrighted works, even if that technology can be used in a way that would not be copyright infringement. Circumvention was the core claim in the YouTube DL takedown. Now, in short, basically what it's saying is that in the 1990s, nothing like YouTube DL actually existed especially something that had this many legal use cases. Now, up until this point, GitHub has been saying they've been taking a developer-focused approach to the DMCA. So what they say they do is that given the cost of developers of an unwarranted takedown of code, we ensure we have a complete notice before we take action. So we distinguish between the code that can merely be used in an infringing way and code that is pre-configured to be used in a certain way. We also recognize that code can provide access to copyrighted content without violating the law, such as in the case of fair use. In some cases, we can keep a project up because the content identified in the takedown notice is not in fact infringing or circumventing a TPM that controls access or copying of copyrighted works. Also, our process sets a higher bar for 1201 claims than the infringement claims we typically get. So in these claims, they basically need to have the person explain why this is actually circumventing this technical measure and how does it actually work? It's not good enough to just say, oh, it's circumventing it, please take it down. They actually need to have a technical explanation of what's actually happening. And that's why in the original takedown notice, they talked about things like the rolling cipher, which was an absolute nonsense explanation. And whenever we process takedowns, we notify all the affected repository owners about the takedown and give them options to dispute it. Now, this isn't actually something they're required to do by law, but any platform that doesn't give its users the option to actually dispute a DMCA takedown is incredibly scummy. I'm looking at you, Twitch. So we allow the repository owner to make changes to address the allegations in the notice, and in many cases, we can keep projects up because they do. So in the case of YouTube DL, they actually gave them the option to remove those comments from the repo, but in the meantime, they did have to remove it because it was still infringing while those comments mentioning the commercial material actually were in the source code. And we are transparent with the developer community about DMCA takedown notices, and then it links to the repo that I showed you earlier. So in the case of YouTube DL, the main claim was circumvention, and they did initially take it down, but as they say here, we also understood that this project's code base had many legitimate purposes, including changing playback speeds for accessibility, preserving evidence in the fight for human rights, aiding journalists in fact-checking, and downloading Creative Commons licensed or public domain videos in the case of doing things like archival, or you just generally want to have them. So what happened in this case is, First, we were able to reinstate a fork of YouTube DL after one of the fork owners applied a patch with changes in response to the notice. So the patch was this one in particular. What they did is basically remove this section where they were doing unit tests with copyrighted material and that pretty much removed the claim. So then after we received new information, which was from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which I showed you earlier, that showed that YouTube DL does not in fact violate the DMCA's anti-circumvention prohibitions, we concluded the allegations did not establish a violation of the law. In addition, the maintainer submitted a patch to the project addressing the allegations of infringement based on the unit test referencing copyrighted videos. So the main fork of YouTube DL also did the same sort of patch and that repository is now available again. So let's see what they're changing going forward. So every single credible 1201 takedown claim will be reviewed by technical experts. The fact that they weren't reviewed by technical experts before is kind of sad and I have no idea what GitHub's actually been doing. Also, they're going to be reviewed by independent specialists when appropriate. 
So this is to ensure that the project actually does meet those circumvention claims. Also, the claims will be scrutinized by legal experts to ensure that unwarranted claims or claims that extend beyond the boundaries of DMCA are rejected. In the case where the claim is ambiguous, we will err on the side of the developer. This is one point where I'm not really sure how well it's going to go for them, but we'll see how this goes in the future. So in the event the claim is found to be complete, legal, and technically legitimate by our experts, we will contact the repository owner and then basically give them the opportunity to dispute it or actually make changes. Only once these steps have been completed will a repository be taken down. After a repository has been taken down due to what appears to be a valid and legitimate 1201 claim, they will still reach out to the owner so that they can actually respond to it and make the changes or just let it fall apart and do whatever they want to do with it. Even after a repository has been taken down to what appears to be a valid claim, we will ensure that the repository owners can still export issues and pull requests and other repository data that does not contain the alleged circumvention code where legally possible. Now, in the case of the circumvention code, you're obviously going to still have the repo available on your computer, so you still actually have access to the code and you can put it up somewhere else, but I'm not suggesting you do anything illegal, that's entirely up to you. We will also staff our trust and safety frontline team to respond to developer tickets in such cases as a top priority. Now, this isn't all they're going to be doing. They're also going to be starting a developer defense fund. So as it says here, a lot of developers rely on nonprofit organizations like the Software Freedom Law Center and the Electronic Frontier Foundation for legal advice. But the problem is that these organizations, they're great organizations. I'm not saying anything like that. It doesn't help them if they actually want to fund a legal case. So what GitHub's going to be doing is helping to fund these cases. So they're going to be starting this developer defense fund and they're not just going to be establishing it. They're also going to be donating $1 million to get it started. And this is going to be to help protect open source developers on GitHub from unwarranted DMCA section 1201 claims. Now, the reason why this is really important is because a lot of really small projects simply can't even afford to pay their developers, let alone funding a legal case. So most teams that receive a takedown notice like this are probably just going to have to let it fly by. So this is actually a really nice gesture from GitHub, and I hope that it actually does continue to get funded and does help a lot of developers in the future. And they end off the article by talking about how they want to help improve the law. So no matter what we do to protect developers' rights, we still must work within the boundaries of the law, and the DMCA's current boundaries are hurting developers. One way to address the problem with the DMCA is to work to improve the law itself and to prevent even worse laws from being enacted around the world. So... We were successful in a multi-year effort to stop the EU copyright directive from mandating upload filters for software development and we're taking lessons from that fight to the US as broader DMCA reforms begin to be discussed. We are also advocating specifically on the anti-circumvention provisions of the DMCA to promote developers' freedom to build socially beneficial tools like YouTube DL. Right now, the US Copyright Office is conducting its eighth training or review process of the exceptions to the anti-circumvention provisions of Section 1201. We'll also be saying more about that soon, but if you believe like we do that the DMCA is overly restrictive in its anti-circumvention provisions and want to change that, you can also contact the Copyright Office directly too. And I would recommend doing that. Obviously, send something professional. Don't just send harassment emails to them because they're going to just go into spam. But if you want to go and voice your concerns to the Copyright Office, I would really recommend doing so. Now, in closing, it is nice to see GitHub actually make some changes. But I still stand by my original point, even though they have this developer fund to help protect developers, if you're doing anything remotely sketchy, do not do it on GitHub, because GitHub, like with Twitch and like with YouTube, is way too big of a target at this point, and they're the targets that big organizations like the RIAA are actually going to go after. If you're doing anything sketchy, go do it on a self-hosted Git repo or a self-hosted GitLab repo. Don't do it on GitHub. So I think that's pretty much everything for me. But before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Chris, Joachim, Donald, Corbinian, Andre, Nathan, Monster, Chikabendo, Joseph, Mitchell, Peter D, Road, Tony, and all of my $2 patrons. If you want to go and support my work, there are links down below to my Subscribestar, Patreon, LibrePay, all of that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over Tea, where... 
I probably should talk about tech topics like this, but I sort of just ramble all the time. And I've got this channel available on Odyssey, Library, and BitChute if you want to watch it on a platform that isn't YouTube. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and I'm out.